back a moment before we continue on with the part three of three on our uh, message series on repentance and just really um, I'm going to ask you to uh, have a moment of silence with me and then I'll close uh, for all the stuff that's going on. Uh, we, we have uh, you know the whole new uh, thing with the coronavirus and you know there's more cases there are more testing, more cases we're getting discovered. We have all that. There's a lot of confusion as to what to do going forward. We still have the people who are rioting and, and uh, protesting and so there's there's just a lot of things going on in our country where uh, we, we need God to intervene. We need God to intervene, and and He's going to do that. But He's going to do that through the church. Uh, we talked about it in Sunday school. You know, in the midst of the whole Roman Empire, what the church did was preach the gospel, share the gospel with other people. So I want to uh, just ask that we take just a couple moments and uh, give you an opportunity to offer up prayers. Uh, for these signs and now I'll close. Father, we come to you and we ask for your intervention in our country. Our country is a sick country, Lord, in many different ways. One, we have the ongoing pandemic of the coronavirus. We ask, uh, we lift this up to you, Lord. We pray uh, that our doctors, our scientists would discover a vaccine and, and come out with a vaccine. That we would have people who uh, will have, uh, you know, some treatments available. Uh, we pray for the sick, um, and we ask for you to heal them. Lord, we also pray for those who are um, committing acts of violence and, and such on communities and people in those communities. Lord, we pray that you would bring law and order and peace back to those environments and that in those areas and that people can feel safe with you once again, you know, feel safe in their homes once again. Most importantly, Lord, we, we pray for the lost in our nation that they would hear the message of Jesus Christ and come to a saving knowledge of you. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, coming up here in a few short weeks, what normally happens on April 15th is about to happen on July 15th. It's going to be that tax time again where everybody has to turn in their taxes. And that is going to be, uh, you know, one of those situations where for the states who have a state income tax, they're going to be happy because they're probably going to get their money uh, for people who, uh, for the federal government, the federal government is going to get uh, some money in, in, in there, but uh, for everyone who is filing to get tax returns and, and stuff, or, or if you owe taxes at the end of every year, you, you've been able to put it off for a while during all of these things that's been going on. Uh, and, and of course, everyone that gets money back. Uh, normally files and, and nurses in, you know, as soon as they get all their documentation and they can file it so they can get that money early on. But you know, in the days of when Jesus walked on the earth, uh, in that early part of the Roman Empire, uh, tax collectors were not amongst the most favored people. 
You see that people, uh, the, the Roman government would allow taxpayers to go out and they had to collect a certain amount of money for the Roman Empire. That money automatically went to the Roman Empire. Then on top of that, anything that the tax collector could get on top of that was his own money. So these tax collectors oftentimes would levy taxes that would keep people so broke and so poor that, that they were scraping for food on a daily basis. It was already kind of a, a harsh environment and, and the situation of the Roman government rule being in place was already harsh, but these tax collectors didn't make it any better. As a matter of fact, oftentimes they made life miserable because if you did not pay your taxes, you were in trouble. And the way they enforced the law was, was in a very, very brutal way. And they didn't care if they took all of your possessions and left you out on the street. They didn't care. They didn't care if they took your children as slaves. Didn't care. It was an environment where, uh, where when it came to tax collectors, they were a group that was despised and hated by everybody. They were a, a unique group that, that most people just couldn't stand. When Jesus came, he saw a young guy, or saw a guy who was, uh, he had some physical limitations, and, and his name was Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus had just, uh, had, he wasn't real tall, he, had, he climbed a tree in order to be able to see Jesus, and when Jesus walked by, he looked up in the tree and he told Zacchaeus, you know, Zacchaeus, I'm, I'm you know, get, come down from the tree, we're going to have supper tonight at your place. And so Zacchaeus, you know, he got down and, and he uh, went into uh, his house and prepared a meal. And, and folks in the Middle East, hospitality was a big, was a big deal. In, in many places it still is. But hospitality was a big deal. When, when you had a guest, they went all out and as best as they could. And Zacchaeus, being a tax collector, also had his tax collector buddies coming over and asked who Jesus uh, wanted to eat with. And the Pharisees and all of them, they were like, why would you associate with those people? I mean, they're tax collectors. And, and why would you go to eat and die? I mean, that, that was like a friendship thing, you know, that when you ate supper together, that, that was implied that, you know, you got along with these people and nobody gets along with the tax collectors. You know, everybody hates them. And Jesus said, you know, he come to heal the sick and the broken heart. He came, you know, to the poor and wretched. And, and the tax collectors, while they weren't physically poor, they were spiritually poor. And in the conversation, uh, we found we find that Zacchaeus was a good guy. He had evidently a moment in his life where he repaid all of the extorted monies back and, and at the time, if he found where he had taken too much from someone, he personally paid them back four times the amount. You see, he had a lifestyle of one way, and then he ended up and turned from that lifestyle and took on a lifestyle of God's way. I'm going to ask you to turn with me and to the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew. Talking about repentance, we have talked about repentance, the contrition of repentance, that is being brokenhearted and, and, uh, and confessing and acknowledging our sins in the light of who God is. 
And then we talked about the intellectual aspect of repentance. Today we're going to talk about uh, our will and our desires. So as we look in the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew, I'm going to read in uh, verse 24 through 26. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would be with us now. We have worshipped you in praise and, and song, and we have worshipped you in our tithes and offerings. And Lord, we come now and we worship you in message. Lord, pray, please, till up the ground, the foul soil of our hearts, and prepare our hearts to receive your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we begin to look at this, we see one of the things that repentance involves is our desires. Now, when we have talked about sin and original sin and our being totally depraved in sin, we said that our desire in sin was not only for sin, but it was against God. So that, that the person who's lost in their sins isn't only looking and embracing sin itself, but he's looking at anything that turns him from God. His desire is to not turn towards God. But when Jesus began to talk to the disciples and he began to explain uh, the, this aspect of what we would call repentance, we would say that the first thing that he's talking about here is the desires have to change. If we are going to repent, which means we turn from our sin, we turn from the desire to sin and the desire to hate God, and then instead we, we desire for God and we desire against sin. It's a change in our desire that we have. There's, there's so many that have this idea that Faith is nothing more than an intellectual ascent, and there is no accountability that they're going to face for their sins. That's not true. Repentance and faith are two words that are interchanged throughout the New Testament when the Bible talks uh, in Acts and, and the guys ask Peter, the crowd asked Peter, what, what, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Later on, Paul said, repent and turn to God and do works which give evidence of repentance. So repentance is that turning. We talked about having a broken and a contrite heart. Those are the things that God likes. Those are the, the, uh, the acknowledgement of sin, the confession of sin, the acknowledgement of the offense to God that sin is. We talked about that. The intellectual aspect, our values, our, our principles that hold us, the things that we intellectually hold on to, those things we turn from the world's views, the world's philosophies, and we turn to God's views, God's values, God's principles, God's philosophy. And then we talk about our desires. Our desires. Jesus, when Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust after her, you have committed adultery with her already in your heart. Or if you hate someone, you have already committed murder in your heart, folks. That's our desires that have to change. We have to turn away from those things that the world tells us is acceptable and turn to God and learn the things that are acceptable to God. And as we turn, 
we turn to a new leadership. You know, when I'm lost and I'm dead in my trespasses and sin, I sit on the throne seat of my life. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about what I want to accomplish. My goals, my career, or whatever it is that, that may be set before me, it's all about me. And when we turn from our sin and turn to the Lord Jesus, we have a change in leadership. Now this isn't all happening over, you know, just in one split second. These are things that we continue to do as Christians. There is a constant battle that we fight, like we says, the, the spirit and or the flesh, it, it's desire against the spirit is against the spirit and the spirit's desire is against the flesh and we, we battle that war we fight that war and, and in the same way we fight who's in control of our lives we fight that That's a, that is a battle I remember talking to a friend of mine and, and his son was going through seminary and this friend of mine was a, was a preacher and his son was going through seminary, and his son did not have a constant, steady job, but he had constant work. He, he would work over this place for a while or that place, and every place he worked, he did great. He made plenty of money. And I remember his dad talking about, you know, son, you, 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 know, you need to settle down. You need to get a steady job. And he was explaining what his son said to me. His son looked at our talk to him and said, Dad, my God owns the, owns the cattle on the thousand years. <coughs> my God promises me all my needs. And, and he said, what can I say? I said, I don't know. He said, but I'll go what you do. <laughs> but, but that's how... That's how we get it. It's, it's that who is the master and who is in control of our lives. You know, will we go and, and pick a career? Will we go and and live have a, a certain, if you would, lifestyle or whatever? Who's in control when that's happening? Who are we listening to? Who are we making sure? Now, there's nothing wrong with work. Trust me. God is all about having a strong work ethic and, and having a, a good, a, you know, a reasonable job. You don't know. No, he's probably not going to be happy if you run a beer joint. That's probably kind of out of context for what we're talking about. But any other job, you know, God in general is going to be happy with that. But is it God that's directing us to do what we're doing? Do we see God in the throne, in our, our Jesus, in the as having and, and sitting in the throne of our lives, and all of our life is centered around Him? What about when we're on the job? Who's in control? Who do we listen to? Who's the master? You see, when we repent, we turn from us being in control, and we turn to Jesus being in control. Your Romans 10, 9 10 says, If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And what is it you have to believe? In the Lord Jesus. Jesus in the Master Jesus. Amen. Jesus didn't come just as Savior. He came to be our Savior and our Master. Amen. He is every time Paul writes his name, you know, in, in God the Father and who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul writes over and over and over. Jesus identified himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. And so all these things that we see as, as Lord, that word,
translated means master or boss man. Jesus is the boss man of our lives. And, and as we make decisions, are we making those decisions based off of what Christ has laid out for us? We talked about, because we're going through Proverbs and Bible study, we talked about the idea of um, you know, the scriptures and the value of the scriptures and, and how we can become familiar with them and kind of learn God's thinking, right? So I don't have to wake up every morning and go, hmm, you know, get down on my knees and pray for hours on end. Do I wear the blue, the black shoes or the brown shoes? You know, I, I don't know that God's really interested in that. He gives us a brain, you know, to do whatever it is, you know, we're going to do about that. Now, modest or immodest, absolutely. There's guidelines on that. You know, he says, hey, so, you know, he tells women and, and guys will fall in that uh, equally well. Don't dress like a prostitute. That's pretty straightforward, you know, when he's, when he's talking about those kinds of things. Don't let, you know, the adornment of your life be the jewelry. Let your spiritual character be the jewelry. Those are things that we learn. Those are things that we give ourselves into. What are my resources given into? Are they the things that I want in life or are they the things that God wants in life? What am I pouring all of my resources into? And again, that a lot of that has to be decision making between you and God. But the thing is, is we have to acknowledge we, instead of just controlling it and owning it on our own, we have to give that to God and ask Him to take control of our entire lives. Again, that's an ongoing and an ever-growing process. And then, as our desires, we turn from our worldly desires to godly desires, as we turn from a self-centered life to a Christ-centered life, we turn from a worldly value system to a godly value system. What do you value in life? The Bible says here, what does a profit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for a soul. What good is it to be the richest man in the world if after you die you're going to spend eternity in hell? Remember the story about the rich man and Lazarus? Lazarus was the poor beggar that, that sat outside the gates of, of Lazarus, of the rich man's home, and the rich man ignored him and didn't pay attention to him. And, and when they both died, the Bible says that La there was Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham, and the rich man was, was in the pit. He was in hell, and there was a wide gap between them. And he looked up, and he saw Lazarus. And he said, please just have Lazarus touch his finger to, you know, dip his finger in water and touch it to my tongue. Folks, that's pretty thirsty. If that, if, if that is a, satis a level of satisfaction, that's pretty thirsty. That's a lot of torment. But we see that what the rich men value was the things that meant most to him, and he didn't value anything of God's. Boy, I'm about to touch on something that just, I know my kids are, are going to kill them. But I'm going to tell you, you know, if you're playing sports on Sunday, instead of taking your kids to church, what value You know, I can make sure my 
child is in school, but it's okay if we see a Bible study. Man, oh man, we're cutting on some toes. It's okay if we watch TV, but we don't have time to sit around and do a family Bible study. What's the value? this easy believism that we go through and I want to tell you something that's not faith that's not faith and folks as parents I get it man you get any sign of your kid that maybe they kind of like the Bible and, and, and we want to say oh they're a believer but repentance is part of of faith. It's the other side of the coin. It is the turning away from us sin and turning to God in every area of my life. Amen. Not just in the things that I do wrong, but in the way I think, in the values that I hold, the desires I have, who's in control of my life, and the values that I hold near and dear to me. All of that, all of that gets impacted in repentance. Jesus said anyone who desires to save their life will lose it. But anyone who loses his life for my sake will save it. Folks, those are, those are key words. Those are important Those are important for us to understand. <clears throat> because it truly means I'm dying to the worldly way of living and I'm trying to live in God's way and in His Word and in His teachings and in surrender to the Holy Spirit. We give ourselves to Christ. We give ourselves, or we take ourselves away, or we turn away from the world, and we turn to God in everything. Now, does that mean I'm a theological PhD when I first come to a saving knowledge of Christ? Absolutely not. And I've said this enough times, but if we don't love God's word, then why are we dying? If we don't love living how God has it laid out for us in his word, what do we value? Where are our values? What is important? John Owens was a Puritan writer, and man, if you ever study anything he writes, you just read a sentence, and sometimes it takes two or three times just to read the sentences because his intellect is so deep. And, and, and it's, you know, to, to go through a whole book that he, that he writes is, is a challenge because, well, for someone like me, you know, it's a challenge because I have to read and we read stuff, and, and in order to get all the meaning that's in there in, in the things that he writes. And he is a well-known author, and he lived as a pastor and was free in the way he lived, and he lived uh, and, and, and has been recognized throughout his life of, in regards to his writing. 
his writings. A friend of his, a pastor buddy of his, was thrown in prison for his beliefs and, and all of that. And that pastor buddy of his, John Bunyan, wrote a book called The Pilgrim's Progress. And for years, that was the number two best-selling book besides the King James Bible. John Bunyan, who, would, who we, in our worldly view, would have considered a failure, touched people for decades because of his writing. Just why John Owen did. Why? Because his values were God's values. His desires were God's desires. Jesus was the master of his life. If you look at Paul, I mean, look, he, he was, he wanted to go to Rome. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, as, as we, we know, and, and he goes to Rome, but not as the Billy Graham type who's going to go and, and have and preach these sermons and have hundreds of thousands of people saved over a year or whatever. Paul goes as a prisoner and he's in prison several different times in Rome but when he goes and visits Rome, it's as a prisoner. In our worldly view, we would hold someone up like Billy Graham and say, man, he's successful. And we would look at someone like Paul and say, oh, no, he was in prison. He was a complete failure. But God used Paul to write a huge portion over 13 letters in the New Testament. Man. <coughs> Paul, his values were God's values. God's values were his values, and, and God's ways were his ways. Paul said, it is no longer I who live in this body of mine, but Christ that lives in me. He talked about his life being poured out as a drink offering to go alongside the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. You see, he gave his life. For Christ. Everything he did, he did for the cause of Christ once he got saved. There was a repentance that happened, a turning away from sin. You know what it was? He was a successful Pharisee, top in the class, top in his intellect, and yet he was a murderer of Christians. But Jesus called him. And Paul turned from all of that, from all of that fame, from all of that glory, and he ended up, at that time, what I'm sure looked like a complete failure. But man, how many people has he touched for centuries when the Holy Spirit used him to write so many, so many letters in the New Testament? Folks, our life needs to change. Our values need to change. Our desires and who's in control of our life needs to change. Now, I don't know where you are in your walk, and we're going to on that screen to come forward, and we're going to have a time of invitation. And during this time, Whatever decision the Lord is leading you to make, I want to encourage you to make that decision. Encourage you to be obedient to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Maybe some of you want to join a church and that, that opportunity exists. Maybe there's those who need to repent of some sins in their life and some things in their life. And you can do that either at the prayer altar, I'll pray with you, or you can do that in the pew right where you are. Whatever the Holy Spirit is guiding you to, what we want 
when we repent is to follow and obey the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to have a word of prayer and then we're going to sing the invitation. Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts, that your spirit would work in our hearts. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would convict us of sin and of righteousness and lead us to the place where we are truly repentant of the things that we need to be repentant of. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand, please. I never knew you did that. How long have I known you now, Don? I didn't even know you did. <laughs> we don't ever get to be around each other. I know. Not much. Oh. Do you want to Yeah, I'm going to stay with that meeting for just a minute. Do you all mind? Hey, Toby. How's your back? I guess it's better. There you go. It's good.